All right, Jacob, I know it's early in Australia right now, but welcome to the Me Mafia podcast. Very excited to have you. Thanks for having me. You've you've got me exactly five minutes after sunrise. So I got to feel a little bit on my skin and now I'm inside chatting to you. So thanks for having me. What's it like in Australia this time of year? Well, we're in autumn, so you've got cool nights. We had our first frost on the farm a couple of nights ago. Uh, so you know, just at just at freezing point, which isn't very common in my area. We might get a dozen frosts a year or something like that. And then the days are beautiful. It's uh, you know, 20 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in your silly measurement system, but it's glorious. Yeah, tw- no, 20 is pretty good. I think I-, I don't know the exact conversion, but I think it's between 70 and 80 degrees. Uh, someone can spot check well, me on that one. Um, you know, it's it's nice. You, you, your sun, your skin feels warm in the sun, and it's nice weather to uh, work in. But uh, if a breeze comes through, it gives you a bit of a chill down your back. So it's a. Uh, I, I, I I used to when I was younger hate the changing seasons and really dislike uh, days that had weather changes during them. But I've grown right. to actually really appreciate it. There's something quite beautiful about it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Having moved to Austin just about a year ago, it's much less seasonal here. It really, the winters are very mild and there are, it just starts, it goes from being like moderately cold to being brutally hot. And that's basically, it's basically one or the other. And I grew up in an area where there was four seasons. So I think I'm starting to appreciate those four seasons a little bit more, um, just the variety of life that you get. But, um, you know, we were excited to talk to you because I was telling you before we hit record, we came across your content through a video that you put out there about your farm store. And it was pretty unique because you didn't have anyone manning your farm store. You were talking about it's kind of this novel idea of having a farm store that's a membership program and then people being able to come and go as they please to buy things. And so I was pretty struck by that just in terms of the novelty of the idea. And it seemed like a lot of people took to it. So um, I just guess for our, our listeners' background, would love to learn a little bit more about your farm operation, Wokey Farms, but then to just diving into what made you start thinking about things a little bit differently um, as it turns into that operation of uh, the membership model. Um, but just as a starting point, would love to learn a little bit more about Wokey Farms. Yeah, sure. Well, we've got a regenerative direct to consumer farm business here in Australia. So everything we're farming at the moment is on leased land. So we're leasing around uh, 300 acres, looking at a couple more blocks at the moment. We're raising beef, pork, chicken, lamb, eggs, and honey, and selling everything direct to consumer. Uh, We're a pasture-based, organic-style farm, so we don't use any chemicals, pesticides. Uh, We don't rely on any medications or pharmaceutical inputs for our animals. Everything we're growing is very clean. That's very important to us. It's actually why we started doing it in the beginning. I've been on a health journey and when I changed the food I was consuming and started giving up the uh, the scripts that the doctor started giving me, I started feeling a lot better. Mm. So now we've only been doing this a few years, but a couple of years into it, it became very apparent but the, the biggest bottleneck in production here in Australia was processing. We mm. couldn't get our animals cut up and packaged. So not, not at the not at the level of consistency that we wanted, not at the frequency, not at the volume. So we purchased a luxury. And just a second, come on in. <laughs> These dogs are gone, man. The, uh, we purchased a butchery and the idea was just to have a, a boning room there. The, the idea was just so I could employ butchers to come in, break down my carcasses, pack the animals, etc. And it was an old store that had a shop front, a very well-known shop front in our town, Aubrey. It had been there for about 70 years, but I never anticipated opening that shop front because the volume we were producing it just didn't make sense to support wages standing out the front scanning meat. I didn't, I'd sell out in a couple of days and I wouldn't have anything for a couple of weeks because our production's lumpy through the seasons. But my customers kept pushing me and pushing me. When's the shop front opening? Because it just made sense, right? You just bought a butchery that's got a shop front. As right. a consumer's point of view, you you purchased the shop front. They, 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 their mind sort of wasn't in that back of house production space. So 
I thought I've got to make it work. The cust- you know, got to give customers what they want. They kept asking for it. And I just put pen to paper and thought the only way this will work is if I don't have that overhead of wages. And I ended up sort of putting my spin of a walk-in vending machine in there. So people can uh, become a member by doing one of our farm tours. And we do that to get people who are invested. We want to meet them. We want them to meet us. We want to show them why we think our beef's different, why we think our eggs are different uh, and valuable. And then we trust them with the unique pin code. They can access the building 24-7 and with an app on their smartphone, they scan the packet to meet. Everything's cryvac packed, labelled and put in display freezers. At the moment, we do all of our produce frozen uh, and off they go. So I think we're getting close to 400 members at the moment. Wow. Uh, you know, there's a there's a core contingency of them who are hyperactive and in there all the time. And there's a there's a big group that that are not, you know, they might uh pop in every other month or something like that. But that's fine as long as people are, you know, getting what they can uh what they need, what they can afford, what they want out of it and tick along, that's fine to us. So yeah, that's been uh it's almost three years now, about two and a half years that we've had that model rolling. Wow. And so before that, what did your model look like? Was it really direct consumer delivery going through a third party processor? So we've been farming since 2019. The the first year we got everything processed by other local butchers. So in Australia, you've basically got your abattoirs, your slaughterhouses and your butchers as the two steps. There's not really abattoirs that do the processing for you, which is what I believe happens a fair bit in the US. So you've got to find an abattoir that'll slaughter your animal and then deliver it to a butcher who will bone it out, uh, slice it and pack it for you. So I was using local abattoirs, trying to line up local butchers, and then I go pick up my meat. And a lot of it went to my own restaurant. I've got a cafe in town here. And then a lot of it, I'd be driving around town, delivering it to people's uh, doors off pre-orders and stuff. But that was, you know, back then we were doing a body of beef. We're aiming to do a body of beef and two pigs a month. And the local butchers were having a hard time, you know, even wrapping their heads around keeping up with that sort of volume because they're busy running their own display cabinet, their own shop front. So I'm looking at it going, I'm only trying to process 10 cows and 20 pigs a year and you guys can't even handle that. Like this was a very obvious uh, bottleneck. So now we do website sales. So the only reason you need to be a member is to access the physical store. You don't need to be a member to buy meat anywhere else. So we've got website sales, subscription boxes. We've got multiple organic supermarkets that retail our meat. We wholesale into cafes and uh, restaurants. You know, we sort of, any way people want it, we got people that buy it through Instagram DMs and, you know, or whatever. We'll, we'll, I'll sell it. I'll take the cash and we'll get on with it. Black (laughs) market. That's right. Black market. Selling a heap on Bitcoin at the moment too. (laughs) Yeah, I saw that. And it's something I definitely want to touch on um, cause it, it goes to show that you're forward thinking in, a, in more ways than one when it comes to what you're doing on the farm. But I, I'm curious, were you regenerative from the get go in 2019? Was that always kind of your vision for the farm when you started it? Yeah, it was growing up. I was a bit of an Xbox kid inside a lot, reading a lot. Uh, I, I, I joke, I've got, I own a bicycle store in town too. And every now and then a, a parent will walk in with their child who's got an arm and a sling because they went over the back and the parents will have a bit of a groan about, oh, you know, this cycling is expensive. And now my kids broke it themselves. And I'll say to them, you know what? I played Xbox for about 15 years and I never once broke a bone. <laughs> And it's interesting because it gets them thinking, you know, it's like, you know, the trade-off's actually worth it. I'd, I'd rather have a child out there in the sun making friends, uh, exercising, and the the cost, risk, benefit of a broken bone now and then. Like since I started cycling, I've broken three, uh, and that's fine. It, it, it's part and parcel uh, what it is. But the reason we started farming in 2019 was because we wanted uh, clean green food for our families. I've, I've had allergies, skin allergies. Uh, nasal like hay, hay fever and all sorts of things really to a debilitating level my whole life and I was highly medicated by my general practitioner I'd be on three scripts a month uh, a script eye drop nose spray and tablet to try to control my allergies and they just got worse and worse and worse every year and not once did that doctor ever ask me what I was eating or how my exercise was going if I was getting enough sunshine if I was drinking water 
uh, quality water, none of these questions. It was always, how are your symptoms? And how do you feel the medication we gave you last time helped? Uh, and I went to, I, I went there and had this big long complaint about how hard I was struggling and that I wanted uh, a steroid injection uh, to the doctor's credit. She didn't give it to me, but she sent me out with an increased, uh, I guess, a more powerful nasal spray. That was the thing that I found I got the most relief from. And I went to the local chemist and purchased it. And as I injected it up each nostril and walked out of the chem, I did it while I was still in the pharmacy. As I walked out onto the street, both nostrils just started bleeding and blood running down my nose. Jeez. Bit of a catalyst moment for me going, this stuff's not making me feel any better. It's the contrary. And my wife's a uh, very uh, patient, uh, in tune, uh, body aware woman, and she's taken me on this health journey. So when we when we started wanting meat that was, uh, you know, organically raised, pasture fed, no drenching, it was really hard to find locally. And my my parents owned a hundred acre hobby farm out of town with a couple of horses and paddy pashes and you know fire spots and jumps that we used to jump cars over and all sorts of stuff. And I said to my folks, could I lease a bit of land and start pushing cows around and chasing them with a with a tractor with chickens in it? And the idea was just to grow the meat for us. But if you're moving 20 cows a day and you're going to eat one a day, you know, you've got 19 left that you've got to do something with. So my little entrepreneurial mind quickly thought, I wonder if I could sell a cow next to mine and, and pay for mine when I when I eat it up. And, you know, now we can't we can't keep up. So for us, it was always about regen in the beginning because we were unsatisfied with other, I guess, meat options. Mm. Uh, in our market and that's not a slight at other local farmers that's more of i guess a um an accent on how specific and how dogmatic we were trying to be because we were really searching for something that that made us feel as, as good as we could and, and you know that's just the the thought pattern that we were on mm. that's really interesting and I, i'm i'm wondering has your perspective on regenerative change since you started in 2019 like, have you grown to fa- find that this movement of not using pesticides, no tilling, not having really open loops, like having a closed loop system, have you found that to be, um, you know, ha- have you changed your thinking on how important it is? Because it does seem like a lot of farmers are are really like all in or all out. And um, I could I could see how your conviction behind it might grow as you've gotten further and further down the regenerative rabbit hole. Yeah, look, I'm I'm all in with regenerative ag, but my uh, my mindset and my um, my my conviction, I guess, and just the way I, I I look at it in the marketplace has changed a lot. You know, when I was starting in 2019, I was I was reading heaps of books, watching heaps of YouTube, listening to heaps of podcasts, going to local workshops, and I met guys like Joel Salatin. Uh, and I was watching, you know, these online guys like, you know, Greg Judy or, 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 you know, whoever else it might be. And it's so, they make it so romantic and it is, you know, I, I love being out on the farm, uh, but it, it's all about when you, when you're watching those sorts of personalities, it's, I guess, uh, not to take anything away from them because the, you know, they're still massive inspirations for me, but it's very romantic. Everything's optimistic. It, it, it's all great. And they've, they're encouraging more and more people to get involved. I agree with all these things, but I'm looking at agriculture and, and regen ag at the moment going, we're inspiring uh, lots of homesteaders and, and backyarders, but where's the, where's the big producers? Because, you know, there's a lot of, I guess information coming out of regen going direct to these homesteaders and backyarders and the and the bigger producers uh maybe laughing at a lot of it or that's not that experience. And I don't want to be a cottage producer. I don't want to I don't want to do 12 bodies of beef and 20 pigs a year. Uh I, I really want to crank some volume out there and feed some people. So mm. my I'm on I'm on a journey and I think that this journey will be never ending, you know, for the next 50 years. But I'm really on a journey, I guess, dialing in my my perspective. Uh, how hard I'm willing to push things. Like in, in the beginning, to give you an example, I was advertising and dogmatic that we were antibiotic free. Uh, being antibiotic free for most people means not feeding your animals uh, feed that's got subtherapeutic antibiotics in it to uh, keep them alive because the conditions they're in are so horrid. But I really took that as antibiotic free. Uh, we don't use it on the farm. And then a couple of years in, I had an animal get cut on a piece of steel in the yards and open up its side so deep that you could see its rumen, you could see through its whole skin cap. 
And I got the vet out to have a look and stitch it up. And the vet's like, do you want to use antibiotics? And I'm looking at this animal that's in my care, um, not visually suffering because cows are extremely robust animals. Like it, the way it carried on, you wouldn't even think it felt it. But I'm looking at it going, you know, do I give the cow antibiotics so it doesn't get infected and potentially die? Or am I dogmatic and antibiotic free, which that whole thing stems from um, trying to get away from a reliance? Like where, where does this scenario fit? on that wavelength uh in the end of the like in that specific circumstance the vetter you know we actually didn't give that cow antibiotics and the cow was fine because we we monitored it very closely but we have started giving i buy old uh, jersey cows from uh, from local uh, dairies and we join them with our bull and every now and then those jersey cows get mastitis because of you know the way they've been bred in the environment they've been in that that's just something that they're predisposed to mm. unfortunately so we we will uh if they're getting really bad mastitis and we can't milk them out of it we will give them antibiotics because we don't want that animal to suffer and lay over and die in the paddock but the way we reconcile that in our operation is then we don't process that cow and sell it to our customers we'll sell it off at the local yard so we're still uh delivering antibiotic free feed to our consumers right you know so that's just i guess that's just one example of something that i came in with all this idealism and then when you've got an animal suffering in front of you in the paddock it's like what are you going to do about it let's take a minute to talk about some of the sponsors and brands who support the show what are you thinking perennial pastures another regenerative farm out of san diego our experience with kevin munya the owner we had him on the show a young first generation rancher who's really empowered by this movement of regenerative agriculture and really wants to be a leader in the space. I think our conversation with him was so insightful just in terms of how mission focused he is and how he really thinks about his farm as a business and wanting it to be here 50, 100 years down the road, even though he's just the first generation of it. And I think just being able to spend time with him out in San Diego was kind of the perfect indication of that where we got to go have a meal with him at his house, hang out with his wife and kids. Like, what an amazing person. And I think his mission focus around raising really high quality beef and restoring nutrients to the soil is just one of, one of those rare missions that I think everyone can get around. Yeah, he has such a commitment to really feeding the local community in San Diego, in the San Diego County, first and foremost. But he's also passionate about feeding the community around the country. So I know they've invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources to being able to order beef in bulk on their website. So I know, I know that they now offer quarter, half, whole cows directly, directly off the website. Um, they have that great ancestral blend ground beef product. So it actually has organ grinds uh, mixed into the ground beef. So you're getting the benefits of like an ounce or so of organ meat but because it's in the ground beef, you really can't taste it at all. And I think to your point, Harry, just another amazing person, you know, he, Kev was someone that he was following a paleo diet in college and started realizing, wow, when I nourish my body with real foods, I feel amazing, had a really successful stint in tech, but realized that there was just something else that he was passionate about. So he's one of those rare cases where, you know, he put his money where his mouth is and he's a first generation farmer, just, you know, bootstrapping this thing, raising money and just so passionate about feeding the community. Just an amazing guy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening. Now we're going to go back to the show. Yeah, it's it's a real challenge when you're kind of an, an evangelist in some ways for a movement that's a burgeoning movement. It's only a few people who are doing it. So you want to do everything by the exact book and follow all the uh, the principles that fall under Regen. Um, but at the same time, you know, th- there has to be some wiggle room, I imagine. And, and it's kind of the same thing on like, you know, these these diet dogmas. It's like, you know, you can go so far and, and end up just kind of losing the point of it all. Um, so it's it seems like you found a, a reasonable solution there with you know, when those things, when those instances do pop up, you, you sell them off to somebody other than your direct customers, which seems like a, a pretty practical approach. Well, we've got a value structure on the farm, a five-step value structure that we uh, we run through when we make these sorts of decisions. And it's number, and, and they're in order. You can't, for us, we can't change the order because it would change our uh, our values, it, it'd affect our perspective. So it's it's animal welfare, environmental backbone, creating healing food 
building a community and making money, being profitable. And so, you know, number one is looking after the animal and and its uh, contextual expression. But number two is uh, stewarding the environment. So if if we're doing something for the animal, and we go, well, that's a nice thing for the animal, does it make sense in the context of our landscape? And then we run through that list. And I think that if you if you do that with an open mind uh, and an and an earnest spirit, you'll you know you'll make pretty good decisions for for all involved. So that's something that's been really helpful and powerful for us. So having started in 2019 and 2020 being an interesting year for everyone, what's uh what did you learn during those those years of COVID? Because I'm sure your business had to pivot and change relatively quickly. And it was still a young business at the time, so the challenges there are probably two more than what, just a you know a, a single layer. You're just a growing business trying to build out your customer base. So curious how that changed your perspective on things. It was probably almost easier because we weren't this going concern with heaps of money in and out and and a big payroll and all of this. We were able to just tick along, I guess. Uh, my, my bicycle store in my restaurant, and at the time I had a um, e-commerce bike store as well. You know, in the beginning of COVID, they really suffered. It was you know challenging. In at the end of 2019, uh, Australia was covered in fire as well. We had these enormous bushfires. So they, when those bushfires at the end of 2019, they were only up the hill from where we live here. Cut my revenue across all my stores 80. Uh, percent You know, like my cafe. Uh, runs at about 40% wages. So when your revenue gets cut 80%, uh, you're really in trouble there. So then COVID came and I thought it felt a bit relentless. And then after we were maybe six months into lockdowns, the business really started booming for us in the bike shop, the cafe, not so much. So, you know, it was it was a really interesting time. The I was still obviously running the farm business and trying to grow that. And it just showed me how fragile our supply system was because the local abattoir, I don't have many options, was just like no private kills. We've been, we've had to send every second staff member home so they're not working too close to each other. We can, we're, and we can't even maintain our own supply to our customers. So no more private kills at the moment. And it was just a real highlight of, you know, you read the books. You, know, you you listen to the prophets out there and they're all preaching about how we need to become decentralized and and how fragile our just in time logistics supply chain is and then to live it and see it in real time uh you know is an eye opener and and it and it backs up a lot of those you know claims that you you're exposed to throughout time so you know it was interesting and also we've got a we've got a relatively vertically integrated business in the sense that we 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 grow everything on the farm it goes off off site to a third party uh, slaughterhouse if it needs to, but then it comes back to our butchery and our cafe relies on all of our farm produce, like all the meat, eggs, honey, and everything that the cafe uses is all from the farm. And vertical integration is really sexy for people. They 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 love talking about it, how cool it is as a business. But when you're vertically integrated and one of those pieces gets mandated to stop. The whole business falls over, like all all layers of the business fall over. So it it also was a bit of a lesson to me because I'll uh, you know, and we'd love to build our own abattoir in the future and really push that whole chain up. But it, it really showed me that I, I'm not convinced that verti- vertical integration is necessarily going to position your company from a real position of strength because it it makes you a bit isolationist. Mm. Uh, there is there is there is some real. Uh, power and utility in having community and friends and colleagues uh, and and business partners and associates that that you can rely on during those times. So yeah, few few big lessons and uh, eye openers. And it was a it, you know it was a challenging time. I've got fifty staff across my businesses, and everyone's coming to work every day, unsure as to if they're going to be allowed to come to work the next day, if the stores will be locked down if if the shop gets locked down what position is the business in to pay us if we're not working you know how does that look right Uh, they were some pretty challenging things to to manage but you know all in all we got through it and we're here how quickly into COVID was it uh 2021 when you bought the butcher shop uh it was the end of 2020 i think okay wow and was that were you using that more so as a way to get away from like close a loop in your own process system to have a butchering front or was it also kind of a marketing angle that you saw to connect with your clientele a little bit more closely 
and give them something that they were just asking for. None of it was about marketing. It was it was mm. purely just about being able to slice that animal uh, at, at at our own leisure, you know, at our own timeline. The, the local butcher that I was using, who's a good dude and he's a good butcher, but he'd tell me that my body of beast would be processed and I could pick it up on Wednesday. So I'd tell all my customers I could deliver it Thursday. And then he'd text me Wednesday, say, oh, it's going to be Friday now. And then on Friday, he'd text me and say, it's going to be Tuesday now because he got busy doing running his own shop. And, and you know, when you've got a customer buying a quarter body of beef for $1,000, hanging for it, and you and you bump their order three times, you know, they think you're a bit of a muppet, even though it was out of my control. So I really purchased the butchery for a few reasons, but one, I wanted to be in control of my own timelines. I wanted to be con- in control of my own uh, quality and consistency. You know, everything we do is cryvac and labeled, and it's really easy to make that look like a dog's breakfast. And right. being a retailer, like my family's been in you know, retail for 50 years, we understand about a presentation and consistency. Uh, and I also wanted to do things like make my uh, make my sausages without preservatives in it. And when I'd ask other local butchers what they thought about uh, steering away from synthetic inputs, you know, one guy in town cussed me out, said I was going to kill people, you know. <laughs> so I, I needed to find a way to be able to, uh, to, to really do the processing in a way that it aligned with our values. So we, we purchased the butchery out of necessity. It was never part of the master plan. It's it's such a great concept though. Like when I first came across it, I was actually just, just moving back into Austin, and there was a uh, there's a farm here in Austin called Churchill Creek Farm, and they opened up. It's it's similar and, and different. It's but it's a man uh, v- very similar in style, where it's like almost like a food truck where you walk in. It's a walk in vending machine, is what you said, and that's the perfect way to describe it. Mm. But there's also there's a person who mans it. And so the advantage of yours is that no, no one really needs to be there. And I wonder if this is something that can scale in other parts of the world, or if it's something that you've seen start to grow in interest from other regenerative farms, because it does create this uh, ability to maybe find better economics outside the city in terms of you know finding better land prices, but then get access to a bigger market um, bigger city uh, market too. So, um, you know, like a lot of the problems I see with like scaling where Jen is like, there's people who are just like far away from big metropolitan cities, but if they had something like this, it could kind of help service that, that issue. So I'm curious if you've seen it, seen this, this uh, idea pick up any steam. Before we get into the episode, let's talk about Fawn Bone Brass Carnivore Blend. A hundred percent. Yeah. We've been huge fans of bone broth the last few months. It's really fueled our carnivore journey. Um, bone broth is incredibly nourishing, especially on a carnivore animal based or just any type of diet, to be honest with you. And what's great about Fawn is that they're a very simple, pure product. So their product is just boiled bones, water, salt, and most of their products have spices like turmeric, cayenne, cracked pepper, but they actually just came out with their carnivore broth, which is very simple chicken bone broth, water, and salt too. So they're eliminating all their spices and just giving you something very pure that won't disrupt the gut. Yeah, I think one of the things we talk about with the elimination diet is the fact that there's so many things that do actually affect how your body reacts to the food you put in your body. And the fact that they're just doing a pure bone broth with bones and just the minimal ingredients, I think is huge. And the carnivore audience will love this one. Uh, Fawn does regenerative bone, so it's really high quality stuff. Go check it out. Use our promo code in the link below. Yep. Code Mafia will get you 15% off your first order. Well, look, when my video went viral in a, in a very short amount of time, it got, you know, basically a million views on Twitter, a million views on TikTok. My website crashed every day for a month. You know, it was, <laughs> um, I wish I had my pixel uh, built into the back end of my website at the time, but I didn't. Right. But I had, I reckon I've probably had 200 people reach out going, how did you do it? We want to do it on our farm. And I replied to every single person uh, with either a copy paste on exactly what uh, software system I use, exactly the security system I use, how they talk to each other. Like I'm not a techie guy. This is all pretty bootstrapped, pretty simple stuff. And then I think maybe 12 people pushed a bit harder. And I actually Zoomed them 
and and sort of coach them through it and gave them a bit of encouragement. And I think out of those 12, probably three people said, we're doing it, we're committed, uh, we're going to have a crack. And I haven't seen anything come out of any of them. So whether this is yeah. something that's still in the plans in the background or not, I think, you know, the the reality is a lot of people are well-intentioned. Uh, a, a lot of people are see a nice idea and want to chase it. And, I'm, you know, there's just not as many people out there that I guess – have the have the grit or the the spirit to actually go and make it happen. So for my own business, I get asked all the time, is the self-service thing going to scale? And I don't really have any interest in opening another one in Melbourne and another one in Sydney. I right. could, I guess. Uh the, the software is a bit clunky. I've got an idea in my head how how it would run better uh in metro areas that were, you know, out of reach for me to sort of touch on a frequent basis. And I've approached approached a few different tech companies on what it would cost to build it, you know, anywhere from 50 to 80K to build what I've got in my head as software to facilitate it. And you know, when a software company quotes you 80K, it's going to be 200. So, you know, I'd much rather take $200,000 and and buy another couple thousand sheep. Right. Yeah. I mean, it it makes total sense. And the trade-offs are always going to be there, but... Um, it seems like it's been a success so far for you, the, the non-man storefront. It's great. Look, our, our turnover at the front fluctuates wildly depending on the actual supply of protein that's available out the front. Like a good week, if I've stocked up those freezers and there's you know a good amount of pork, beef, lamb and chicken, we'll be doing you know seven or $8,000 uh, wow. turnover, which I don't know what that five, 5K US yeah, uh, and then when my supply dwindles because we're we're running a bit lean and haven't had an animal come in for for a week or two, it'll it'll cut back and we'll do two or three k for the week. But you know, for a business that's got the only overheads of freezers running, which would be running holding my inventory anyway, in a you know one and a half percent to payment processing fees, two thousand dollars is fine. That that was the whole point of it. I knew I wasn't going to light the world on fire and do. You know, millions of dollars of turnover out there because my farm just didn't have that uh, production at the time, and so anything I get get out there is is fantastic. It's basically a roadside stall with a little bit of security. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, just having a little bit of security there holds people accountable, and the fact that you make them come out to your farm and actually do a farm tour before they become a member, I think, probably makes a big difference as well. Um, I'm curious, the regenerative ag movement in general, is there anything that you see locally uh, that excites you? Because I I feel like personally, there's been a lot of excitement um, of the movement growing, and it seems like it is growing, but I'm wondering if if you're experiencing the same thing. Like, are people actually catching on to this movement? And is it growing the way that it's being perceived by, I think, like, a lot of social media accounts making it, you know, I think it gets somewhat of like a sensationalized uh, tone to it at, at points. I can't keep up at all. Like I can only, I guess, really speak for my own business and and not the movement or industry at large. But in my uh, Wolke Farm business, I can't keep up with supply at all. Like I don't have a cut of lamb available. I don't have a cut of chicken available. Wow. I've processed three cows in the last week and a half and I've barely got a piece of beef available. You know, like we, we, we're not even touching the sides and I've only got uh, Albury, which is my hometown of about 80,000 people. I've only got Albury I'm supplying and I've just turned Melbourne on so I can ship to Melbourne. It's about three hours south of us and I'm doing no no marketing or anything. I'm getting, you know, maybe a dozen orders a week through Melbourne, which doesn't sound like much, but when you're packing 40 kilos of meat in a box 12 times a week and shipping it down to Melbourne, you know, it's, it's a lot of volume to handle for a small farm to push down there. So we can't keep up at all. And, and obviously people are finding us because of our, our, our processes and, and product, our, what we're producing. Um, I, the majority of people, I believe from my interaction are not coming to us because we're, uh, environmental warriors it, it's it's not because we're regen it's because they're on a health journey and need specific foods to heal their bodies and families and they've identified that that only comes from regen mm. 
So I think, you know, we're splitting hairs. It's, it's much of a muchness, but I'm starting to work with, I've got four doctors in Australia now, two in my hometown and two in cities that when they see a patient, they refer them to me. It's almost like they write a script for Wolkie Farm. It's like, well, you need to stop. Uh, you need to stop drinking all this soft drink. You need to stop hitting all this alcohol, smoking and, and eating all these refined sugars and carbohydrates. <laughs> Pardon me, but that's not enough. When, you, when you're knuckling down on your protein intake, it has to be the right protein from the right place. Um, and we're inc- incredibly honoured to be uh, viewed to, to be the right place. And, and that's where a lot of our cons- consumer demands coming from at the moment. Mm. Can you speak to that nutrition part a little bit more in the sense of that there is a difference between the quality of regenerative versus other protein sources, whether it be other conventionally raised beef or just obviously processed food is, is in a whole different category, but I'm just curious and pressing in a little bit more on the nutrition stuff. Cause it seems like maybe the science hasn't fully caught up to it yet, but there's definitely a difference um, at least on a massive level. Anecdotally, it seems like there's a lot of N of ones out there. Well, look, there's, uh, the, what you've got is the industrial complex running its factory farms and its feedlots with uh, enormous backing and funding, and they're able to run all sorts of tests, uh, make all sorts of claims, put the spin on it with the HR department and, and, and the legal team and whatever else it might be, versus all these small farmers that are earnestly trying their best in their pasture-based systems and don't have the you know necessarily the funding or the backing and they're not sophisticated enough to go out there pay for the tests interpret them put the spin on them whack them out into the industry so when you said like that there's a lot of claims but not a lot of data you know it's it's almost it's almost like by design of the system so right. we're actually I'm, I'm i'm i used to talk about our food being nutrient dense i don't anymore because i don't have the data to back that up we are currently uh, working at doing uh, building a system around nutritional paneling across our different uh, enterprises and doing that annually because we we open source. We're working towards on our website being able to see our soil tests and our nutrition tests on our different proteins annually, so you can track us over time. We haven't got there yet because there's quite a few different lab options and tests are very expensive. You know, the egg test that I wanted done was about seven thousand dollars. Wow, so. You know, it, there's a there's a real barrier of entry there. So in in terms of you know, if you want some, I guess scientific grab out of me, I don't have it, and if I did, I'd probably be uh, apprehensive to give it to you. But I'm a real heretic when it comes to this stuff because at the end of the day, you know, the data is important if you're going to make a claim in some legal setting. But I I actually uh, don't care about the data because I speak to people every day who were sick and on. Um, on insulin for their type two diabetes, and now they're healthy and they're not, and it's because they've changed what they're eating and their environment that they're operating in. So I'm really bullish on the fact that he- food can heal because if you're going to be taking, uh, you know, like what, what are our bodies designed to absorb? You know, like all, all that can affect your health is your environment and your inputs. So it just it just makes sense. One plus one equals two, and mm-hmm. over time we've over time as a species we haven't eaten medicated animals right so it just makes sense that animals that are eating a species appropriate diet being being cared for the right way that are uh, don't have a gut full of uh medicines uh, makes sense for you so my, my whole thing like we get a lot of people asking us sort of this similar thing especially on farm tours i actually have a doctor dr max Golhane, that comes on me with a lot of my farm tours and we bounce off each other throughout the day but what we tell people is instead of going online, doing all the research, because you'll you'll find a vegan study paid for by a vegan activist group that's being pushed by a vegan doctor. And then on the other side, you'll you'll find a, a carnivore doctor citing a carnivore study, pumping right. it to the carnivore boys. Instead of researching and getting yourself muddled up with all these different PhDs and, and all these different personalities and, and things you don't even understand, just do it to yourself. Go vegan for three months, see how you feel. Go carnivore for three months, see how you feel. I had someone chew me out for suggesting this on Twitter by saying I was being unscientific. And I was thinking to myself, what's more scientific? Like, like don't take anyone else's word for it. Do it on yourself. Keep a journal. Look at your poo. Do I have a sloppy poo in the toilet or do I have a well-formed stool? You know, like actually test yourself and, and see how you feel. And 
you know, just just my own. I love the saying that uh, data is the plural of anecdote. My own data from listening to all the anecdotes on my farm tours is when you start eating uh, low chemical meats, you feel great. Right. It's funny. People are so reluctant to experiment, whether it's, you know, take a risk on a business idea or experiment with their own health. It just, it, it always surprises me how reluctant people are when they're either not forced to, or like they don't, they don't have the thing like you had allergies that push you to start making some changes. Like if you don't have that thing that makes you take that push, it can be challenging, but it all, it always surprises me that um, people aren't more willing to just experiment. But I do, I feel optimistic about that too, because I do think that the, there are things that are enabling a little bit more of a decentralized approach to figuring things out for yourself, whether it's wearing a wearable or having a blood glucose monitor on at all times, like those types of things can give you a little bit of data. But at the end of the day, it's what you're talking about. It's like, are you feeling better? Did the, does the food actually make you feel better? Can you see the difference in your energy and uh, the weight if, if that's an issue for you? So it, it's it's just funny to me to to hear people talk about, you know, how reluctant they are to make some of those changes. It's not even small gains either. And, and I've really over my uh, farm tours, I guess, been able to dial in a few examples to really show people uh, what I'm talking about. It's like hands up in the crowd. If after you have a, a, a KFC Zinger box for lunch, within about 15 minutes, you feel like you need to lay down on the couch and veg out for the next two and a half hours. And everyone puts their hand up because everyone's had a KFC Zinger box and you all know that you lose all your energy and you feel doughy and your digestion goes to hell afterwards. And then, then I say to them, you know, once you eat food, you're not meant to have no energy. Like right. you've just fueled your body. So how come you're consuming something and then you feel like dirt straight away? And now, you know, likewise, hands up, if you just ate a steak, how would you feel? And you eat a steak and you get back to work or you, you go for a walk with your wife or whatever it is because you don't feel doughy and you're not bogged down. And it, it's really simple to give. It's like have too much alcohol and you feel like dirt, but drink a nice glass of uh, water and you feel fine. Like there's no – so sometimes – you know, if you if you're feeling bad, it's like it's like you're deterring from the baseline. And right. so I think when people are when people are uh, when you're when you're eating bad, you're you're falling from the baseline. And people are viewing uh, the, the health as the baseline. So when they're doing something healthy, they, they feel like they should be feeling better than that. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It's like like feeling good should be your status, your status quo, your default. And anything that pulls you away from being good is proof that that stuff's not good for you. It's not like you're going to eat a steak and you got, you're going to go outside and, and high jump 2.3 meters straight away. <laughs> it's like, you're just going to feel good because that's how you should feel. Yeah. It's something we talk about a lot on the podcast, just in general, like a lot of people have, or I mean, I just think there are so many things societally that are interfering with our intuition and our actual baseline health that most people don't know what it's like to not be on some sort of pharmaceutical drug or get eight hours of sleep or seven hours of sleep and feel well rested and eat good whole foods. Like if I bet you that's less than 10% of people and it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty staggering because that is what a few decades ago would have categorized someone as like a healthy person, someone who doesn't need to have medication, um, who can, you know, be active with their, their family and still, still feel healthy. So I don't know. It's just, uh, well, I touched, go sorry ahead. to talk over you, but no, I touched no, on this a second ago and I know this gets icky and, and people probably think I'm a bit of a weirdo for talking about it, but even educating people on what their poo should look like, I think would 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 lead people so far down the path of realizing how internally unhealthy they are. And as a farmer, I walk around the farm with my with my head in the dirt. I don't walk around with my head in the clouds like some eternal optimist. I'm looking down going, how's my grass going? How's my ground cover? How's my soil? How's my poo? Because I can look at the poo and see the condition of my cows and I can interpret uh, and I can interpret their gut health and also uh, their digestibility of what they're eating, how much goodness they're getting out of it, if it's too rich in nitrogen and if it's giving them diarrhea and stuff. 
And I just think, like, you look at everybody and how metabolically unhealthy they are just at a visual glance because, you know, you know, shock horror, if you're morbidly overweight, you're not healthy. Like this narrative that we're pushing that um, or this body, body positivity that fat people are healthy is just a bit of a laugh. And none of these people are putting out well-formed firm stools, uh, you know, regularly. You know, which is what it really needs to be. You need to be putting putting out a well uh, formed firm stool regularly. This is weird stuff, right? But they're they're running to the toilet. Some days they'll do three in their sloppy things, and some days they won't poo for two days. And I know this from experience. Part of the reason I had all these allergy issues was I was drinking the the Coca Cola and eating the KFC and right. and working indoors in a shopping center under um, fluorescent lights fourteen hours a day, and just in all these um, bad environment, bad input. And as a result, bad output. And so I know exactly what these people are going from because I can speak from um, I can speak from experience. And I actually think that there's something in that, like as an animal manager who's hyper important. So as a, we're all human managers, we've all got population one of the human that we're trying to manage. And I, I really think that, that could be a really powerful tool that we could educate people with. And it'd probably go viral if you became the poo guy. Maybe I should do it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you want, if you need the career pivot, uh, it could be, it could be a nice viral piece for you. You can, you can say, um, this guy talks a lot of shit. <laughs> All right. Let's make shirts. Let's not tell anyone. We won't, we won't air this episode for a little while. And then, uh, we'll air the, uh, <laughs> the, the poo man. We might need to, the brainstorm. It. Um, but it, it actually plays into the trend that I think is going to be, I become more and more prevalent, which people talking about gut health, the microbiome, like that hasn't really gone mainstream yet. Like there are certain pockets of the the health world that are talking about it. And I think it's probably been some, it's, it's obviously some ancient wisdom, but I think it's about to get repopularized in a big way where we connect our food to our gut health and we can then kind of see the light, which is regenerative farming and, and what we're actually doing to the soil is affecting us in so many ways. It, it, it's something that I, you know, I think hopefully 10 years from now, we're, we're talking about it and saying it, it happened. But um, yeah, I think this gut health narrative that you're talking about is huge. And it's interesting too, because you were saying you look down when you're walking the farm. And I was going to ask you sort of what you've seen from your perspective in terms of regeneration of the land have you seen certain practices start to pay off and see the land start to come back to life? Immediately, you know, yeah. immediately from, from managing the principles like, uh, you know, frequent rotation of livestock, um, you know, not overgrazing in overgrazing is a, t- is a time thing. So not leaving animals in the same paddock for too long. Like when, when animals, walk into a paddock they're going to overgraze certain plants immediately if you if your concept of overgrazing is chewing them too low but what the where the damage really happens is if they're in that paddock a week later and the plants regrown and you and you hit it again that's when the damage is starting to occur and so once you start managing these uh, using these holistic management tools moving animals uh, measuring things you know just things uh like the the rate at which our cow paddies our cow manure gets metabolized by dung beetles and soil is just incredible sometimes you'll come into a paddock and and it's been like three days and the poo's all gone really because there's so much vibrancy uh in the ecosystem on the land that it sucks it up now before i took over the farm and my father was running it like a hobby farm he would just buy in 40 steers to fatten and then flick at the end of the season and when they turned up on the farm you know good good practice from that sort of uh, mindset was just to drench them all. So make make sure none of them had in, internal uh, parasites or worms and you kick them out on the farm. And when you sold them off eight months later, 10 months later, all their manure paddies everywhere would still be sitting on the floor, rock hard, um, completely oxidized because all the nutrients haven't been absorbed by the uh, soil. They've all been oxidized and leached into the atmosphere and they've sat there and baked. And so that's just one little example of, you know, and that's night and day. All you need to do to change our system is just have an animal that hasn't been drenched because a drench kills internal parasites, which are like insects, I guess. Right. And the the bugs outside of the ecosystem that want to help digest that manure, things like your dug beetles, they're insects. If they go in that manure after that cow's been drenched, they're going to get killed. So they're not going to touch it. Mm. Um, things like erosion, we, we fenced 
we've got a few waterways that come through the farm and we fence them off. Uh, as soon as I took over, it's the very first thing I did to keep animals out of the waterways. For me, that's a welfare and an environmental thing and they feed into each other. The reason it's a welfare thing is if you let animals walk into water courses like, like a pond or a, or a creek and drink, they're going to stand up to their belly with all their friends, urinate and defecate, have a gut full of water and their parasite load is going to increase. Mm. So that's that's the welfare component of it. If you fence it off and just pump that water straight to them with a simple little pump and a polytroph, they're going to have clean water all the time. So you're going to negate your need to drench but the environment actually bounces back really well because these water courses aren't having um, constant impact, heavy impact by these animals. And now all of our water courses on the farm, all of our riparian areas are completely vegetated to the water's edge. There's no bare banks or anything. So the last two years we've had uh, in incredible floods. This is Australia, right? You're either on fire or underwater. We've had incredible flooding. And I've had no ro erosion. I've had no soil loss. I've had no creeping of banks by uh, and, and creeks widening. And my neighbours have had masses of it. And not all of it's their fault. You know, there's some other factors going on. But, you know, some, some extremely uh, vibrant and tangible results, basically immediately, just from deploying wow. really basic, you know, management practices. Does that just speak to how mismanaged some of the land is? Yeah, absolutely. Like like most most of it's um most farmers, you know, uh, I really want to be careful not to, I guess, be, become like this anti-farmer crusader, but but most farmers love their land and love their animals and just don't do much about it. You know, if 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 you're a full-time farmer and you've got 400 cows on your on your, you know, generational farm, and that's the that's the whole enterprise. I sort of wonder what you do with your day because managing 400 cows doesn't take much time. Like it sounds like a lot's going on, but I, you know, sometimes some some farmers are extremely busy. But I've got my I've got my questions as to what a lot of them do all the time. They could be planting a few more trees and putting up a few more fences. I reckon. <laughs> yeah, um, one of the things that has stood out to me over the course of the interviews that we've done. So we, we've interviewed Joel, who you mentioned earlier. We had a great interview with Will Harris. And he mentioned just the idea of closing loops on the farm. He says he loves to close loops. And that mm -hmm. like st that really stuck with me because in order to create a sustainable system, both like economically sustainable and environmentally, um, you kind of need to have systems that just play off each other in every area and th actually allow for th the operation to not be relying on things outside um, of your control. Is there anything that you see on your farm or that you see as something, some loop that you're trying to close um, currently? I guess there's a couple. Uh, I've just bought a bone crusher for the butchery. So when we process an animal, you know, we'll, some weeks we'll be throwing out three to 400 kilograms worth of bones. Wow. And, you know, people say, why don't you sell the bones to people to make broth and sell it as pet bones? It's like we do. Uh, but <laughs> You know, there's the choice bones for broth that people want, and then there's the marrow bones for marrow. There's a lot more of a cow left behind. Like you'll you'll still have over a hundred kilos of bones sometimes. You know, wow. at the end of the week. So, so I bought a bone crusher. Cost me um, a, a pretty penny, but I think it'll be worth it. And I've been hoarding all my bones the last a month. Actually, the bone crusher should turn up next week because we we I'm very jealous about looking at all those nutrients that I've grown out on my farm disappear out the back door of the butchery and, and walk away in the bin. Like it upsets me. I'm right. thinking, you know, yeah, it's nice to sell the the, the scotch and the mints and, and then sell a few marrow bones, but that, I, like I still, that's still quality stuff. There's no crap in that. So it's full of phosphorus and, and calcium and, and things that I want. So we're going to crush it up with the bone crusher. We're going to uh, put a bit in our pet mints that we sell, like our dog food. Uh, but we're also going to add it to our compost at home because we take all of our, at the moment, we're taking all of our green waste from our restaurant, coffee grinds and, and you know, uh, the crust off toast that people don't eat and whatever it is. It ends up being about four to six street bins of waste a week. And we take that out to the farm and add it to our chicken bedding from our brooder sheds and start mm. composting it. So we'll, we'll add the bone meal in there to add that to the compost. 
Um, so that's, I guess, uh, my big one at the moment that I'm, I'm trying to to work on. But in terms of closed loops, I guess probably the, the biggest loop is that we still onboard a lot of animals from others. We, we don't breed everything ourselves. And I guess you could you could call that a loop. Um, I know Will Harris, who I um, respect greatly, has a very big uh, herd of cattle and he's got a closed herd. So he he produces all of his own replacement stock. We're not at, a, at that stage yet. We don't have the volume to make that viable. But I'm also not wanting to necessarily shut down all of those loops uh, purely because I think you become a little bit of a um, – isolationist and maybe you can handle that at the scale that that wills at and maybe if i was doing that volume I'd, I'd be doing what he's doing too but like to give you an example i was breeding pigs for our pork enterprise and because i didn't have the skill set uh i didn't have the the land I, I didn't have the the volume demand i was doing a really average job at it and i was producing not amazing pigs like they were pretty good they're probably still better than the pink ones in the factory farms but for my context i'm like my, my the guy of the road's got better pigs than me so i sold all my breeding pigs no i didn't i ate all my breeding pigs turned them all into bacon and and uh and uh, uh mints and sausages and i found a guy up the road a couple of hours up the road jason at stock and piggle who does uh, he's a he's a free-range pig farmer breeds brilliant pigs and now every three weeks he delivers 20 pigs mm. and they're, and they're fantastic pigs. And I'm really happy to be able to uh, support his enterprise and his family and his farm and leverage his IP and labor over the years and get really good pigs off him. So I guess, you know, closing loops in terms of uh, fertility and, and water cycle and sales. And I'm really bullish on all of that, but I do believe in uh, I guess still having some, uh, c community to supply you and bounce off. Right. Yeah. It kind of goes back to your vertical integration point where, yeah, vertically integrated sounds great until you, you have a fault, some sort of fault or, or, uh, error happen in one of those layers of the vertical integration. And then you're kind of shit out of luck. So it, it does, it probably helps the resiliency of your business, having someone who can actually support you that you trust, who has a, a, pig operation that can supply you guys with, uh, you know, pigs when you need them. Um, it's also really nice because when I wanted to go from 10 pigs every three week delivery to 20, I didn't have to think about it. I just text right. him, you know, on my own farm, if I wanted to go, if I was breeding, you know, uh, one sow every three weeks and getting 10 pigs and I wanted to start breeding two sows every three weeks, you know, there'd, there'd be more to it. I'd need to uh, find a sow to retain. I'd need to organize feed, organize paddocks and shelter, uh, have staff trained to watch it. You know, there's a lot because I'm not optimized for that. So even just in an efficiencies sense, it, it, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure I asked you about was your interest in Bitcoin and, and how that started. Your Twitter profile mentions regenerative farming and Bitcoin. And I think over the past 12 months, there's been this movement on Twitter talking about the connection between the two. And it's really interesting to me. I think there's a lot there, but I'm curious how you got involved with it and, and how you started thinking that way. Well, I've been, uh, I guess, mildly interested in cryptocurrencies as a whole uh, for a few years during the pandemic lockdowns when you couldn't go out to the restaurants with your friends and stuff. There was a couple of buddies and myself that started a, uh, a, a like an open chat group and we were all day trading these meme coins and stuff and just having a bit of fun. I think we all started with a hundred dollars and the, and the, you know, it was competition to who could get to a thousand bucks first or whatever it was <laughs> to see if we could day trade our way up. And, and we weren't looking that as uh, invest investing or, or anything. It was gambling. Like we were, under the uh, full knowledge that we were in there um, having a gamble with each other. But it just, it seemed like a bit more fun than getting on the horses or some other stupid yeah. thing. And when I finished that and and cashed out all my tokens, I, I, I had been involved enough at that stage to realize that not all coins were the same. Like there were some uh, meme coins, things like, uh, you know, Doge coin or, or whatever it is that would, or, or the, now they've got the Pepe, there were these coins that were just for a bit of a laugh and a bit of a pump and dump. 
And then there were other coins that were making real claims, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin that were actually being a bit more serious and trying to address real world, real world um, issues and, and function. And, you know, that, that just on a surface level that became available. And then at our butchery, we do quite a lot of custom processing for other farmers. So they'll send in a body of beef of their own, we'll cut and pack it to their specs, put their own logo on the bag. And then they can go sell it to their customers. And I was doing my first body of beef for, for a gentleman who sent me his pack list. So he wanted me to put it in boxes for his customers. And when I was reading his pack list that he sent me, there was a column that said payment method and it was uh, fiat. And I'd never seen cash written as fiat before. <laughs> you know, it was either like cash. People would send it through it and say like cash, bank transfer, bank transfer. But it was fiat, BTC. Fiat, Fiat, BTC, and it, it was getting either um, cash, uh, AUD, or Bitcoin. And so when I shipped these boxes and and uh, called him a couple of days later just to make sure everything was good, I said, oh, I noticed that you have Bitcoin down as a payment process. And he was, you know, this guy can, can talk Bitcoin. And just I said the magic B word in his presence, and he was off. We were on the phone for 40 minutes chatting about it. And I learned a lot of, I learned more about Bitcoin in that 40 minutes than I had in the previous year of mucking around online, you know, day trading through one of these platforms. And, you know, for me, it's it's like telling people that my food's healing food and I don't need a study to say that it's the answer when I'm hearing people's testimonies and watching their lives change. For me, I, I don't need a study or a PhD to tell me that our current monetary system is rancid you know the, no one even talks about paying down any of our country's debt anymore and if they did and if they made real strides towards paying down the debt which you need to do i don't think anyone needs to like have some sort of intellectually clever premise that we've got to pay down the debt like you can't just you can't just keep making more debt forever right, right? it just doesn't work like that yeah. so and then no one's even addressing that. And you look at that and the, and, the, and the monetary system's just in trouble. And I think if you're not part of a solution, you're part of the problem. And, and, and for me, looking around, Bitcoin is so interesting and offers so many solutions. Is it going to be the solution long term? You know, like, I don't know. It'd be cool if it was. I think it's got the potential to be. But I think that there's there's so much... Um, you know, clever coding and and fail safes and just by design the system's better. We're running a fiscal policy, a, a fiscal system here in the West on like nineteen forties technology, and we're in twenty twenty three. Like we're just we're, we're so far behind the eight ball. So I, I have I accept it on my website. People can buy boxes of meat and pay Bitcoin straight through the website. It comes to me on chain, and you know, out of the dozen or so boxes I've been sending down to Melbourne the last few weeks, probably a quarter of them are paid with in Sats. That's so cool. I mean, that's that's amazing. So, a quarter of the people from Melbourne paid in Sats. Yeah. So that's obviously a skewed statistic because that doesn't mean a quarter a quarter of producers are using bitcoins. It means I'm overly attracting bitcoin units because I attract bitcoin. But that's fine, you know. Like, I'll, good. I'll, yeah. That's right. If, and honestly, yeah. if somebody called me and they said we want to pay gold bullion for beef, I'd let them ship it to me. It wouldn't bother me at all. Like I'll I'll take I'll yeah. take anything any which way. Yeah, that's great. Well, the fact that you're accepting Bitcoin is is amazing. It seems like farmers kind of get the language of of uh, sound money um, better than most, or better than people who you know th think that they understand uh, sound money and. I wonder a lot of times what, why that is, um, but I think they just understand economics a lot better than the average person as well. Yeah, I guess to be a farmer, um, you, you have to be watching the market a lot. Like you can't just get your paycheck for doing your job every week. They they rely on uh, economy and supply and demand. So they, they they rely on the health of the economy and you know what the consumer demand is. So they're always watching the market, seeing what uh, cattle are worth at the yards, seeing what it's worth over the hook at the at the slaughterhouse, all these different things. So yeah, maybe there's maybe there's something in that. My personal experience is it's is uh it's the smaller regen startups with with younger operators that are more open to it. And it might just be a def demographic thing because most of these, I guess, the older, more mature, uh, real farmers, air quotes, real farmers 
around the area and that see me mucking around with Bitcoin all think I'm a bit of a Muppet. Maybe I am. We'll see who has the final laugh. Um, well, it's been a great conversation, Jacob. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, you almost feel like it almost feels like I'm talking to the farmer of the future with a walk-in uh, vending machine, machine style storefront, your blue blocker glasses, Bitcoin, regenerative farming. Uh, you're hitting on all the topics that we like to talk about. So just uh, appreciate you, appreciate your time and uh, just love what you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good to finally connect and uh, good luck with your podcast. Love what, what you guys are doing. Appreciate it.